everyone. Uh, just pre-podcast Charlotte here with a trigger warning. This episode is still about Pee Wee, therefore we're going to be talking about some topics like child abuse, sexual abuse, torture. So just another heads up for that kind of thing. Just brace yourself before it all starts. Thanks, guys. I'm Dina, and welcome to The Grim Curriculum. My search history, <laughs> after the last week, oh lord, is so concerning and so terrifying that I actually went back and I looked at it and like read it off to myself, oh, and I'm lord. pretty sure I am on so many different lists list. right now. <laughs> the FBI agent that's in your phone is like, oh my god, Dina. They're like, is she okay? Like, we, we need to check on Dina. Although, that being said, mine's probably not much better. And mine's not usually super mm, what you might call normal because, uh, you know, like, I do a lot of special effects makeup in my spare time. So, like, some of the things I look up are, like, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, because it's something that I like to recreate. So mine's like, usually a little, like, <laughs> wacky and out there. But, uh, yeah, after researching Pee Wee. It's a mess. We're a mess. Our brains are a mess. And we hope that you, friends, are ready for this mess. Yeah, I mean, Pee Wee was a little guy, but his story is so big that, uh, as you may have guessed, we're taking two full episodes to talk about him. If you haven't listened to part one, go back, listen to part one, then come to this, uh, because you're going to want to kind of uh, warm up to the nastiness that we're going to be going on for today. Get yourself ready. Uh, otherwise, if you've already listened and you're ready for more, here we are. This uh, horrible little human being, uh, his story continues, and we're ready to get to the really bad stuff. Pee-wee's Root's about to take a real twisted turn. Like we mentioned in the last episode, Pee-wee had earned himself a spot in federal prison in Atlanta, Georgia. This was his first experience in a federal prison, and while it would be a very brutal place, it was not nearly as bad for him as state prison or the reform schools were. In both his book and other interviews, Pee Wee talks a lot about this time in his life and how much he enjoyed it. This is where we have to remind you that Pee Wee really liked to talk, and in many of his stories, they're wildly exaggerated or probably even completely false. Like we said in our first episode, unless we specify that Pee Wee may have been lying, we have every reason to believe he was being truthful. Don't worry though, there'll be a lot of exaggerated and we legitimately hope made up stories to talk about later. Pee Wee claims that when he arrived in federal prison, his reputation and word of his previous escapes have made its way into the prison. He said that when he arrived, people knew who he was and they knew not to mess with him. He claims at this point that he met who he calls the Wise Men. The Wise Men were a group of well-known and influential mobsters that were serving time in the same prison as Pee Wee. One of them was reported to be none other than Frank Costello. And prison records do actually indicate that Frank Costello was serving time there at this time. Now, the name Frank Costello may sound familiar to some of you. Frank was an Italian-American crime boss for the Luciano crime family. He was known as the Prime Minister, and it is said that while The Godfather was based on Vito Corleone, the character is actually much more similar to Frank Costello. To put it simply, the man was a living legend at the time. Frank Costello and his men had money, power, and connections, and apparently they took a liking to Pee Wee Gaskins. Pee Wee claims that one day he was summoned by Costello and his men and that they even took him under their wing and taught him everything that he needed to know. He said they gave him the name Lil Hatchet Man because they knew of his previous violent assaults on people with hatchets. Not only that, Pee Wee claims that the mob taught him how to be a better criminal. He said they taught him how to do things like kill people in different ways as well as how to dispose of bodies properly. Pee Wee even claims that when they were eventually released, he received an invitation to join them once he had finished his sentence something Pee Wee says he regretfully declined. Pee Wee was released from prison once again in 1961 at the age of 28. He returned to South Carolina and moved to Florence where he rented a trailer from his cousin Marvin Parrott. Pee Wee had a hard time finding work and he would work on repainting old cars, but he had a very hard time staying out of trouble. Pee Wee, now on parole, took a job with traveling Reverend George E. Todd. Pee Wee's job was to serve as an assistant to the Reverend while he visited various towns to preach. What the Reverend didn't know was that he was just giving Pee Wee a whole new group of people to victimize. 
They were visiting so many towns that Pilu was able to run off while the Reverend was preaching and rob their houses while everyone was distracted by his sermons. Soon after they returned to Florence, Pee-wee left the traveling ministry because he wanted to do something where he'd make more money. In 1962, Pee-wee married for a third time. Wife number three would be Jerry Dolores, who was 18 years old at the time. However, finding love again did nothing to stop Pee-wee from committing his crimes, and in September of that year, he was arrested for sexually assaulting another young girl. This one was 12 years old, and she lived near his mother's house. Pee-wee was caught almost right away because he was very well known in the town already and had a reputation as being violent towards children. Because of all of this, his wife left him, for the time being at least. Pee-wee was taken to the Florence County Courthouse to be sentenced. While he was waiting for his attorney to arrive, the deputy who was in charge of him uncuffed him so that he'd be more comfortable while he was waiting. Pee-wee, never missing an opportunity, jumped out of the window 30 feet down into a bush. Somehow, he was not injured at all, and he was able to run into the parking lot where he stole a Florence County car that still had the keys in the ignition. This is the second time we know of where Pee-wee has stolen a car because someone left the keys in the ignition. Just that we know of. So stop doing that. Obviously. Pee-wee needed money if he was going to survive on the run, so he visited his mom and then headed to Prospect, South Carolina. He abandoned the stolen car in a lake and left on foot to the town of Dillon, South Carolina. There, he stole a 1962 Ford Galaxy and crossed into North Carolina, where he stayed at a boarding house in the Lumbee Indian Reservation in Pembroke. Here, Pee-wee would meet wife numero four, a 17-year-old named Lenny Oxendean. She fell in love with him very quickly, and they got married, despite the fact that Pee-wee's still actually married to Jerry. Once again, this romance wouldn't work out for Pee-wee, and sadly, they broke up soon after. Something that's kind of funny, which I think is actually a little bit terrible to say, but it's okay because it's Pee-wee, is the fact that she pulled the whole going to the store and never coming back thing. She just kind of got tired of being married and told him that she was running off for a bit, and then she just never came back. Can you blame her? Off. She dodged a big old bullet. A teeny tiny little bullet. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, uh, Pee-wee really needed to have a female presence in his life, and he was lonely after Lenny left him, and he called Jerry and asked her for her forgiveness. Despite the fact that he sexually assaulted a 12-year-old while with her, she forgave him. Pee-wee and Jerry set out to Lake Wales, Florida to find Boss Paw so that they could get back into the carnival scene. Sadly, Pee-wee was given the news that Boss Paws had died by suicide after his entire family had tragically died in a fire. Since Pee-wee didn't have his connections to Boss Paws anymore, he was unable to get a job at the carnival. Jerry didn't want to be married to a man on the run who couldn't even get work at a carnival, and she told Pee-wee that she was going back home to South Carolina. Pee-wee actually considered going back to his fourth wife, Lenny, but changed his mind and ended up driving Jerry back home. Pee-wee kind of had a few options, I he guess. He liked got... to keep his options open. He really did. As the two drove into Georgia, they heard sirens behind them and realized that the police were after them. Pee-wee attempted to dodge them, but left rather his left front tire blew out and he crashed his car into a marsh. Pee-wee had a lot of wives, but he certainly wasn't husband material. In a cruel attempt to escape, he left Jerry in the car as it sank. He left his wife to drown in a car in a swamp. Luckily, the police found her before it was too late, but Jerry was arrested, but she was later released without charges. Pee-wee hid in the swamp, and the police, thinking that he probably drowned, gave up by nightfall and left the scene. Pee-wee started walking, and eventually he found some train tracks that led him close to Savannah, Georgia. There, he jumped on a train and slept until he arrived in Savannah. He got himself cleaned up, found some new clothing, and caught a bus back to Lenny, who was not happy to see him. She had heard about a murderer who the police had thought drowned in the swamp, and she thought it could have been Pee-wee. She called the local police to let them know that the killer was alive and staying in her house. Once again, Pee-wee would find himself waking up to cops surrounding him and arresting him. He was then sent back to prison in Florence. At this point, Pee-wee had been on the run for almost two years. He was sentenced for the statutory rape he had committed, as well as his escape from the courthouse. As soon as he returned to the prison, he was once again given power man status. He had a pretty decent time here because of this status, and people seemed to know not to mess with him. Somehow, Pee-wee befriended a man named Willis McDougall, who was the warden of the prison. This warden believed in rehabilitation of inmates and in eliminating excessive punishment. He actually wrote a letter to the parole board and asked them to release Pee-wee because of good behavior. I'm 
genuinely all for rehabilitation and making people better, but I also think that some people are just straight up not good people and shouldn't be a part of society. Society. Sorry, I'm getting all flustered because this is frustrating. It's disgusting. Um, Pee Wee at this point had shown that he was willing to kill. He was willing to sexually assault pretty much anything and anyone he felt like. He had a violent history, and his reputation was scary, he was unpredictable, and all of this was well-earned. And Charlotte, you're gonna love this, because despite all of that, Pee-wee managed to serve only four years of his eight-year sentence, and he was given parole under the stipulation that he couldn't return to Florence, South Carolina, for two years. I swear to God, if you actually, like, took all the things he did, and then sort of gave him, like, a life sentence for everything, because that's what he deserved... The man would be serving, like, thousands of years. <laughs> the thing I don't get is, like, who, like, I understand what the warden was trying to do, and I can respect that. Yes. But I feel like if you want to rehabilitate your inmates, that doesn't have to apply to all of them. Like, just pick the ones that you think have the potential to be rehabilitated. I He agree. has done nothing to show us that he no. can do that at this point. No, I think all he really had going for him was the charisma that he seemed to just exude. Absolutely. Uh, but that being said, it does look like at this point Pee Wee did want to try to do better, but unfortunately that wouldn't last long because he began to get what he called them aggravated and bothersome feelings. These bothersome feelings could have come from a number of places. Maybe it was the result of Pee Wee's brain trauma from drinking kerosene as a child, or the result of his many different traumas that he endured throughout his life, or maybe he was just born evil. Either way, these bothersome feelings would be what he would say let him to commit what are known as his coastal kills. And I hate to say this to you all again, but this is where the story gets even worse. Pee Wee found a job in Sumter, South Carolina as a roofer during the day. At night, he would work on and paint stolen cars. It wouldn't take him long to start committing robberies during the evenings and weekends. Normal hobby things. Right? What we all do on evenings and exactly. weekends. You know, some people play video games, some people commit robberies. It's fine. They commit robberies on video games. That's true. You know, I feel like if Pee Wee could have just gotten his hands on some Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto would have saved Pee Wee Gaston <laughs> and everybody else. True. Facts. Uh, Pee Wee committed a robbery with two teenage boys. The two boys who it looks like were either very careless or just didn't know who they were dealing with pulled their knives on Pee Wee and attempted to steal his cut of the loot. They actually managed to rob him and leave with his loot. Pee Wee was absolutely furious that he had been robbed. He made his way to the home of the young boys and pulled a gun on them. He forced them into the trunk of his car and drove them to a nearby swamp. There, he ordered them to hand over the money and the jewels they had stolen. And once they did, he told them to remove their clothes. Pee Wee had the boys at gunpoint while they were naked and pleading for their lives. In a weird moment of mercy, Pee Wee let them live as long as they promised to never cross him again. Despite the fact that he was forbidden from returning to Florence County, Pee Wee would still return on multiple occasions. He still had a lot of family there, including his mother and his first wife, Mary. Pee-wee's daughter, Shirley, also lived there. Shirley was now 17, and she was married with children of her own. If you ever have a chance, I highly recommend watching the Shirley Gaskins interview that she did for the show Evil Lives Here. It's on Discovery+, Plus and it's genuinely heartbreaking. It's so sad. She has so much love for Pee-wee, despite everything he's done. She completely believes everything that he claims to have done, and some of the murders that we will talk about shortly affected her directly. By the summer of 1968, Pee-wee's bothersome feelings became too much for him to handle. Pee-wee would describe this as a bothersome pain that would start in his testicles and travel up his spine and into his stomach, finally settling behind his eyes, causing a horrible migraine. He claims that he would then hear a voice speaking to him, and that voice would tell him to hurt people and commit unspeakable acts. He would also describe this feeling by saying, Getting the guts and balls to kill someone just to pleasure yourself is the only difficult part. Once you're done the first, you come to know that the real special feeling and you can't hardly wait until another better idea comes and leads and pulls and pushes you until it takes you into another place and even higher than you've ever been before. Pee-wee claimed that during this time, if he found himself around his ex-wife Mary or his daughter Shirley, he would leave because he didn't want to hurt them. Instead, he would seek out other victims. Shirley claims that at this time, she noticed her pet cats would constantly be disappearing. She learned later in life that Pee-wee was likely killing her pets. 
Pee-wee had a lot of rage towards men for sure, but it's undeniable that he had a huge amount of rage towards women. He set out to hurt women multiple times at this point, and it seemed that he harbored a lot of anger and animosity towards how women had treated him in the past. It was around this time that Pee-wee began to ride around the coastal highway that stretched from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. He would keep an eye out for hitchhikers, usually women. Pee-wee began having fantasies about him assaulting and torturing women. Pee-wee didn't want to return to prison, so he tried to avoid giving in to the temptation, but it wouldn't last for long. This is when he began what he would call his coastal killings. Once again, we just want to warn you all that this is going to get quite heavy. We do need to state that while quite a few of the murders Pee-wee committed were confirmed to have been done by him, the coastal killings are not the same. Not all of these were confirmed, and the details come from his book, The Final Truth. You will notice that these crimes stand out for a number of reasons. The killings he had committed before were brutal, but it seems like a lot of them were committed because Pee-wee needed to get rid of that person to begin with. For example, he killed Hazel Brazel to become a power man. It was almost an act of convenience for him. He needed him gone in order for his life to get better, so he did what he had to do. The coastal killings are different because they are so much more violent, which is a lot to say after some of the things we've already talked about. The brutality and sheer torture that he talks about will honestly just leave you hoping that he was making these up, but we don't know. In 1969, Pee-wee picked up a hitchhiker in Polly Island by the name of Angie. Pee-wee propositioned Angie for sex, but she rejected him and allegedly laughed at the size of his penis. Pee-wee, who we by this point know did not handle any insults about his size well, flew into a fit of rage and he beat her unconscious. Pee-wee then sexually assaulted her both vaginally and anally. This alone did not satisfy his fantasies, so Pee-wee then bit off her nipple and he crushed her pubic bone by stomping on it. He then proceeded to slice her from her rectum to her vagina. She was likely still alive when this happened. About this, Pee-wee said, All I could think about is how I could do anything I wanted to her. Pee-wee had a body to dispose of. He couldn't keep her alive out of fear that she would somehow survive and tell people what he had done. Pee-wee stole her money and attached some weights to Angie and he threw her into the swamp where she drowned. Pee-wee would only wait six weeks before killing again. He claimed at this point that the bothersome feelings were unbearable for him and that he would take them as a sign that he needed to kill again. This would quickly become the main driving force in his life. In October of that year, Pee-wee claims to have met a woman named Daisy who was from Jacksonville, Florida. She was working in Myrtle Beach when she had the bad luck of meeting Pee-wee. And by bad luck, we mean he basically did exactly the same thing to her. He began to find new way to torture his victims at this point, and he claimed that he would try to keep them alive for as long as possible so he could watch them suffer. Pee-wee would kill his victims in a number of ways, but he would prefer to use stabbing or strangulation to kill. He would also continue to heavily mutilate his victims. In The Final Truth, Pee-wee claims he would cannibalize some of his victims, and that he forced some of his victims to eat their own flesh. However, this is one of those facts that we have not fully confirmed, so we'll let you decide whether or not you think he went that far. Pee-wee claims to have killed eight to nine women this way, although it's not been confirmed. Pee-wee claimed that in his book he would commit a coastal killing about every six weeks. However, he also said that the bothersome feelings would occur around the 10th of every month, which is when he would go out and kill. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of evidence to go off of when it comes to these killings. There were people going missing around that time, and a lot of folks would just move around from one place to the next very regularly, as well as a lot of unsolved murder cases were happening then. It isn't impossible to say that he did this, but unfortunately, we will probably never know the full truth. Along with his coastal kills, Pee-wee also had what he would call his serious murders. His coastal killings murder victims were hitchhikers that he didn't know, but the serious murders were people he killed that were known to him. And here's a really wild fact about Pee-wee. He didn't drink or use drugs. He said that he would occasionally have a beer or two, but this wasn't the case of someone being an angry or uncontrollable drunk. Pee-wee claims that he was stone cold sober for the murders he committed. He would still spend a lot of time in bars. We actually chatted about this behind the scenes last week, and I think there are a few reasons he didn't drink, but the main thing that we kind of both agreed on is that he didn't drink because it would give him a huge disadvantage if he was mad or wanted to fight someone. With him being so small, he did everything he had to do to control people, and it would be much easier to just not potentially fight someone who was uncontrollably, rather uncontrollably drunk but it would also be a lot easier to charm folks who were drinking and get them to like him. 
So Pee-wee would just take advantage of drunk women by offering them rides, and he would use this method to lure at least two young women to their deaths. Him not drinking also separates him from a lot of serial killers who needed to be almost blackout drunk to commit their crimes. The two main ones that come to mind when we talk about this are Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy. Both men would have to drink to the point of absolute inebriation in order to be able to commit their crimes. Pee-wee had no problem doing everything he did sober, and that says a lot about the kind of person he is. Definitely. On November 10th, 1970, Pee-wee saw his 15-year-old niece Janice Kirby and her 17-year-old friend Patricia Ann Allsbrook at a bar. The two girls were drunk, and Pee-wee offered them a ride home. Since they knew Pee-wee, they accepted. However, they soon realized that Pee-wee was not taking them to either of their homes. When they asked him what he was doing, he said he was driving around so that they could sober up. Pee-wee brought the girls to his house. Janice, who was very intoxicated, passed out, and Pee-wee used this opportunity to expose himself to Patricia, who immediately attempted to run. Unfortunately, Pee-wee caught up to her. He threatened to shoot her and he sat her down. He then attempted to sexually assault his niece, which woke her up, which caused a struggle. Janice, at this point, ran towards him with a lamp that she had picked up and hit him over the head, which caused him to fall over. Patricia and Janice ran out of the house, but Pee-wee caught up to them as they were running through the woods. Once again, Pee-wee pointed his gun at the girls and made them walk back to his house. Once they arrived, he ordered Patricia to undress, which she did. Janice used this opportunity to attempt to escape once again, but Pee-wee stopped her by hitting her and knocking her unconscious. Both of these young women put up such a fight... Patricia found a piece of wood and she hit him over the head with it, but Pee-wee hit her with his gun and knocked her unconscious too. Once they were incapacitated, Pee-wee handcuffed them and he sexually assaulted them both before beating them to death. He then carried them to his trunk. He disposed of the body of Patricia in a septic tank and he buried his niece Janice in a small unmarked grave near Shirley Gaskin's house, which is all the more heartbreaking considering the two were quite close. Less than a month later, the daughter of State Senator James Coutino went missing her name was Margaret Peggy Coutino. She was only 13 years old. Not only was her father a senator, but her grandfather was the president of Clemson U University. Pee Wee was actually questioned regarding her disappearance, but he apparently had a solid enough alibi and was let go. Twelve days later, the body of Margaret was discovered in a wooded area known as Manchester Forest. An autopsy showed that she died from numerous blows to the head and that she was strangled. There were numerous burn marks found on her body, that looked like they had been done with a lit cigarette. It is likely that she was tortured before she was killed. The level of decomposition of the body showed that she had only been killed a few days prior and that she was likely held against her will. This, along with how she had been killed, were all things Pee Wee had been known for. However, the police had no way of knowing that. What made it even more confusing for the police was that a truck driver named William Pierce confessed to her murder and was sentenced to life in prison for it. What's even more baffling is that Pee-wee did confess to this murder, but he later retracted his confession and said that he was pressured into doing it by investigators. William Pierce then appealed his sentence, and he was denied, despite the fact that his lawyers were able to provide a ton of evidence that showed that Pee-wee had been working not far from where she was taken. By 1970, Pee-wee had finished his time on parole without any issues and was free to go back to Florence County. Can you guess what he did as soon as he got there? Found another wife? He found another wife. Mm. And for those of you keeping count, that's wife number five. By the time they got married, she was already pregnant and would soon give birth to a boy who they named Donald Lee Gaskins. Pee-wee now had a new family, and he made an attempt to give up his life of crime once again. He got a job at a used car lot where he helped fix up cars for them to sell. This didn't last long, and soon enough, Pee-wee found himself stealing vehicles and selling them. Pee-wee also couldn't stop killing, and he claims that by the end of 1971, he killed 11 women. He would go through another cool-down period, but it only lasted until March 29th of the following year. Pee-wee murdered a 20-year-old woman named Martha Ann Dix. Martha, who sometimes went by Clyde, was a lesbian, possibly bisexual woman, who Pee-wee hung around with sometimes. They would spend time at his garage where they would tell jokes and sometimes flirt with each other. She started telling people, possibly jokingly, that she had been intimate with Pee-wee and that she was pregnant with his child and that she had joked about calling the child Pee-wee Dix. This was something that Pee-wee did not take kindly to because, and this probably won't shock you, Pee-wee was incredibly racist and uh, Martha was a black woman. Pee-wee claims that he invited her to a house where he beat her and forced her to take pills that would cause her to overdose and die. 
He dumped her body in a drainage ditch, and her remains were never found. In June of 1972, Pee-wee kidnapped a 16-year-old girl named Anne Culberson. He tortured her for 96 hours and killed her with a hammer. He buried her in the same place as his niece. And like the terrible little energizer bunny of a human being that he was, Pee-wee just kept killing. And in 1973, he killed 14-year-old Jackie Freeman, who had run away from her home in Minnesota and made it all the way to South Carolina. He abducted her and held her captive while he sexually assaulted her before killing her. This murder stands out because this was the first time he would actually claim that he engaged in cannibalism. He claimed in the final truth that he ate a portion of her calf. In 1973, Pee-wee purchased a hearse from a man in town who had trouble selling it. He would drive it around as his, as his everyday vehicle, and he even had a sign in the window that said, We haul anything, living or dead. When people asked him why he had purchased a hearse, he loudly said that he needed it for the bodies of all the people he was killing. Everyone thought he was just being his usual inappropriate self and that he was joking. They couldn't have been more wrong. Pee-wee would regularly use his hearse to offer rides to people that he would later assault, kill, or both. He would also use it to dispose of the bodies. He also had a little siren that he attached to his hearse and he would crank it from the driver's seat whenever he arrived somewhere. And this is one of those things about Pee-wee where like if you saw it in a movie, you'd be like, oh, it's a little bit much, don't you think? Like it's a little bit too much of a cliche. But Pee-wee, as it turns out, had a flair for the dramatic, and as we know, the truth is often stranger than fiction. In 1973, he would commit one of his most atrocious murders, and that's a lot to say for Pee-wee. Doreen Dempsey was a pregnant woman who lived near the Gaskins' house. She had a two-year-old daughter named Robin Michelle. At this point, most of the people in town, especially women, knew Pee-wee was probably someone they should stay away from. However, Pee-wee had earned her trust, and they had somewhat gotten to know each other. And I just want to take a second to talk about Shirley Gaskins again here, because this is a murder that really deeply affected her, and she talks about how he never hurt her, but he would often hurt people that she cared about. And I think this kind of situation is particularly cruel, because... Doreen and her baby showed up at Shirley's house with Pee-wee and Pee-wee asked if they could stay at her house. She had a really small house and her kids were already sharing one room and she said, you know what, I'm really sorry, I, I just don't have the space. And he said it was fine, he said they would find somewhere else to stay. Um, they gave the baby to Shirley for her to like give the baby a bath and she dressed her in her like daughter's little pink dress and gave the baby back and that was the last time that she saw them. And she continues even when she gave this interview to blame herself for this murder because she thinks if she had let them stay at her house that Doreen and her baby would still be alive. It's unclear whether Doreen approached Pee-wee for a ride to the bus stop so that she could travel out of town or if he offered it to her. And this, we maintain, was one of Pee-wee's most horrible murders. He took Doreen, who we will again mention that she was pregnant, and her two-year-old Michelle into the woods where their final moments were full of torture, pain, and fear. We actually had a long talk about this particular crime of Pee-wee's while we were researching, and we both agreed that this is about as far as we're going to elaborate on what he did to this poor woman and her baby. The information's out there if you want to read it, but this is one of those things that will probably never leave your brain, so just be forewarned before you go hunting. Just don't bother. You don't need to know. Just trust us. Just trust that it's fucking awful. Yep. Um... What makes it more horrifying is that in the final truth, Pee-wee described what he did to the toddler as one of the best experiences of his life, and if that doesn't make you want to hurl a little bit, you might want to see a therapist. He also claims that one of the reasons he killed Doreen was because the father of her unborn child was a black man. And after he killed them, he buried them together in a shallow grave in what became his own personal graveyard that was on his property in Prospect. The exact location of this graveyard will shock you, but we're not going to tell you where that was yet. Now, most serial killers have a type. Something you'll notice about Pee-wee is that he didn't really have a victim type at all. He basically just killed the people he felt like killing, regardless of age, race, or sex. But he claims that shortly after killing Doreen and her baby, he murdered two teenage boys. He did not give any further details, and not only were their bodies never found, we don't even know what their names were. Pee-wee claims that his next victims were killed in 1974. They were a couple named Johnny Sellers and Jesse Ruth Judy. Johnny Sellers had been involved in some thefts with Pee-wee and owed him money. 
Pee Wee invited him out into the woods and told him that there were stolen goods he could have. He talked about this in his book, saying, Me and Johnny walked around there in the woods, and I pretended I seen a snake, and I asked Johnny, did he have his gun with him? So Johnny says, I ain't got no bullets for my gun. I went back to my car, got my gun, and shot Johnny. He then went to get Judy, who was at a house nearby. He took her to the forest and killed her as well because he didn't want a witness. He buried the two nearby. It's incredibly hard to keep track of all of these murders, and we have to remind you that Pee-wee would later confess to over 100 murders. At this time, it is speculated that he also killed two carnival workers who had been known to date black men. However, we don't know much else about these two. He also claims to have killed three young people, a man and two women whose van had broken down. He claims to have sexually assaulted all three of them and that he castrated the male. He also says that he stole their van to fix it up and sell it, which is something that he did do very often for money. However, this job was a big one because the van was in horrible shape and Pee-wee needed help moving it. This is where we introduce Pee-wee's friend, Walter Neely. Walter Neely was an ex-con who drove the van back to Pee-wee's garage. You'll notice that this is one of the first times we really mention Pee-wee having an accomplice with his killings. He was pretty adamant until this point that he worked by himself when it came to the murders. Unfortunately, Pee-wee also felt the need to brag to Walter and told him about all of the people he had killed and where he had hidden some of the bodies. In 1975, Pee-wee was approached by a woman named Suzanne Kipper who wanted to hire him to kill her ex-fiance, who was a very wealthy farmer named Silas Barnwell Yates. He sounds like a farmer. He sounds, Silas. He sounds like a fancy farmer. <laughs> Barnwell. The two had been engaged... And he had given her a beautiful diamond ring and a new horse. However, upon their breakup, he demanded the gifts back. She offered Pee-wee $1,500 to kill him. This time, there were multiple people involved. And when there are multiple people involved, there is a larger risk of things going wrong. Pee-wee agreed to kill Silas. He had two associates named John Owens and John Powell, who handled the communication between him and Suzanne during this time, and he also got some help from Walter Neely's ex-wife, Diane. On February 12, 1975, Diane lured Silas out of his house by claiming she had car problems and needed his help. Pee-wee then kidnapped and murdered Silas Yates as John Owens and John Powell watched. The three men then disposed of the body in an undisclosed location. Diane Neely then made the very dangerous decision to try and blackmail Pee-wee for $5,000, along with her then-boyfriend, Avery Leroy Howard. The two were killed by Pee-wee in order to stop them from potentially telling anyone about his crimes. His next murder is another particularly hard-hitting one, and it really shows how cruel of a man he was. His daughter Shirley talks about this murder in her Evil Lives Here interview. She says that one day, Pee-wee showed up at her house with a 13-year-old girl named Kim Galkins. He told her that her mother had passed away and she needed a place to stay for the summer. Shirley, who is now an adult with a family at this point, took her in. Shirley developed a very loving relationship with the girl, who called her grandmama. She says she loved her like a daughter and that she was very important to her. During this time, Shirley lived very close to Pee-wee's mother, Mary, and they would often spend time together and have family meals together. One evening, Kim left the house to go to Mary's for dinner. A few minutes later, Shirley arrived and was shocked to hear that Kim had never shown up at the house. She was nowhere to be found. Shirley says she then called her father and told him that the girl was missing. She told him that she was going to call the police so that they could file a missing persons report. Pee-wee insisted that she didn't, which surprised her. Shirley, who was raised to basically believe anything her father said, said that this was the first time in her life that she had disobeyed her father. She called the police and filed a report. She says that out of everything her father did, this murder was the hardest for her to deal with. Pee-wee claims he killed her because she rejected him sexually. It was around this time that 15-year-old Johnny Knight and 29-year-old Dennis Bellamy made the terrible mistake of messing with Pee-wee. Pee-wee killed them too, and it's likely that he called on Walter Neely to help him with either the murders, disposing of the bodies, or both. Pee-wee, for some reason, took Dennis Bellamy's shoes and kept them in a closet in his trailer. Shirley Gaskins would actually find these shoes and question him about them. Pee-wee told her that they belonged to someone who gave them to him so that he could give them to someone else. She believed him. At this point, the search for Kim Galkins was still on, and Pee-wee had become a suspect in the murder. The police showed up at Shirley's property, where Pee-wee had a trailer, and they asked her if she knew where her father was and told her that he was a suspect in a murder investigation. They searched his trailer and found Dennis Bellamy's shoes. They immediately knew they were his. 
They advised Shirley to call the police department if she saw her dad soon. Little did they know that Pee Wee was hiding up in a tree the whole time watching the entire thing happen. He told her that he was being framed and he went on the run. Like some kind of creepy homicidal monkey or something. I just picture like him as like a tiny little angry squirrel just like up in that tree watching everything happen and just like chittering and being evil. Oh, honestly. The police eventually located some of Kim's clothing in Pee Wee's trailer and had enough to indict him for contributing to the delinquency of a minor. They found him and arrested him for this, and while he was waiting for his trial, they began to question Walter Neely, who very quickly broke down and told them everything. He told them about the murders, the bodies, and even led investigators to Pee Wee's personal graveyard. Once Walter led investigators to where the majority of the bodies were, a search began for the missing people. Shockingly enough, Pee Wee's private graveyard was on Shirley's property. Numerous bodies were found, including those of Johnny Sellers, Jesse Ruth Judy, Johnny Knight, Dennis Bellamy, Avery Howard, Diane Neely, as well as Doreen Dempsey and her baby. It took six days for the bodies to all be found. About the bodies, an investigator said, Some of the victims were so young, you could tell they were young. And then there was the baby. We all knew that we were involved in something that wasn't like anything we'd ever seen before. Walter and Pee Wee were both charged with murder. Pee Wee was now looking at eight murder charges, but he was a suspect in around 40 cases at this time. Homicide detectives in several counties were looking to connect him to missing persons cases they had. Pee Wee was tried first for the murder of Dennis Bellamy, and both him and Walter Neely were sentenced to death. However, later that year, the Supreme Court voted to overturn the death penalty in South Carolina, and they were given life sentences. While this was happening, more and more bodies were turning up, and a lot of these people had been linked to Pee Wee. The body of Patricia Ann Allsbrook was found in a septic tank in Sumner County on November 4th, 1976. Her body had been there for six years. One week later, the body of Kim Gelkins was found in Williamsburg County, and the body of Silas Yates was found about a mile away. Pee Wee was charged with the death of Silas Yates and was given his second life sentence just a few months before the death penalty would be brought back to South Carolina. A few days after that trial ended, the body of Martha Dix was found. At this point, the prosecution was pushing for the death penalty now and the option was back on the table. However, Pee Wee's lawyers argued that he shouldn't be sentenced to death for murders that were committed during a time where the death sentence did not exist in South Carolina. Suzanne Kipper, John Powell, and John Owens were all sentenced to life in prison. Suzanne would be paroled in 2007. Pee Wee, who did not want the death penalty, really started talking. He confessed to killing all of the people found buried in Prospect by Shirley's house, as well as killing more people whose bodies would never be found. He was taken by police to look for the body of Kim Gelkins, and she was found buried in a small, unmarked grave in Prospect right by Shirley's house. Pee Wee confessed to multiple murders. Some were legit, and he was able to provide proof, and some were not. Either way, it looked like Pee Wee was going to be spending the rest of his life in prison. Everyone knew who he was, and he was well-respected and quite feared by many of the other inmates. Pee Wee would lie reasonably low until 1982 when he participated in yet another murder for hire. This time, the target was another prisoner. Pee-wee's last victim would be Rudolph Tyner, who was a 23-year-old man on death row for the double murder of Bill and Myrtle Moon, who had been the owners of a store he had robbed. However, it was looking like Tyner, who had multiple mental health issues, would possibly get out due to reason of insanity. The son of Bill and Myrtle, a man named Tony Simo, paid Pee-wee $2,000 to kill Tyner because the appeals process was taking too long and he didn't want the man who had killed his parents to go free. Pee Wee originally tried to befriend Tyner and poison him, but that didn't work. He needed to try something drastic. He found himself a job as a prison maintenance man, and he now had access to all sorts of different tools. He then decided he would kill him with explosives. He called Tony Simo on the outside and told him, I came up with something. He can't be no damn making sick on it. I need one electric cap and as much of a stick of damn dynamite as you can get. And? I'll take a damn radio and rig it into a bomb, and when he plugs that son of a bitch up, it'll blow him into hell. And somehow, Pee Wee managed to have explosives, along with other items, smuggled in for him. He built his bomb, and he suggested to Tyner that they should have communication systems set up between them. He attached a cup to the device for Tyner to put up to his ear in order to hear him talking. He passed it to him and asked him if it worked, 
And when Tyner held it up to his ear and plugged it in, the device exploded and it killed him immediately. Pee Wee Gaskins managed to blow up a man on death row, which is absolutely wild. Prison officials listened to his recorded prison phone calls and Pee Wee was soon charged with the murder of Rudolf Tyner. At this time, the murder carried a death sentence that stuck and Pee Wee was sentenced to death. In an attempt to avoid the death penalty, Pee Wee continued to confess to more murders, but it wasn't enough. It was at this point that he confessed to the murder of Margaret Coutinho, but William Pierce had already been sentenced and Pee Wee's confession was ignored due to the fact that prosecutors thought he was just doing it for media attention. During the last few months of his life, Pee Wee worked with Wilton Earl on The Final Truth, which would be published after his death. If all of the murders he confessed to are true, then Pee Wee Gaskins was one of the most evil men in American history. If only the confirmed murders are true, he is still incredibly evil. It is clear by now that Pee Wee had absolutely no respect or consideration for the lives of others. However, when it came to his own life, the idea of dying terrified him, and he continued to try and appeal his death sentence until it was no longer an option. On the day of his execution, Pee Wee attempted to put fate into his own hands and tried to kill himself by slitting his wrists. He was given 20 stitches before he was sent to the electric chair. His final words were, I'll let my lawyers talk for me. I'm ready to go. And at 1.05 a.m. on September 6, 1991, Donald Pee Wee Gaskins was pronounced dead by electrocution. It is said that he was so small that he had to climb into the chair. One of the people present for the execution was Sheriff Billy Barnes, one of the law enforcement officials who had been responsible for bringing down Pee Wee. Barnes does not believe that Pee Wee committed all of the murders he confessed to. He claims that Pee Wee would phone him and tell him what he had done and always provided details, but he does not believe that he would have killed anyone and not told him about it. When he was interviewed for The Final Truth, he said, I think if there had been anybody else, he would have called me and wanted a chance to get out of the penitentiary to walk around in the woods to show me another body, because he was always looking for a chance to escape. He called me on a regular basis, and I think if there was anything else, he would have told me about it. And with that, the life of Pee Wee was over. It's absolutely unreal how one person could have caused this much pain and suffering wherever he went. While he had no official final words, we wanted to share one of his quotes from The Final Truth that we think describes the state of the mind towards the end very well. I have walked the same path as God by taking lives and making others afraid. I became God's equal. Through killing others, I became my own master. Through my own power, I came to my own redemption. Wow, uh, that's it. That's the story of Pee Wee Gaskins, the meanest man in America. And I think we can all agree that he has earned that name. The idea that people like this exist out there is actually like, unreal to me. The amount of evil that was inside of him is almost difficult to believe. He truly hurt everyone he came into contact with in some way or another. That's what really breaks my heart about Shirley Gaskins. Oh my god. She loved her dad so much, no matter what he did. She talks about how he never hurt her directly, but it's clear that he still found many ways to make her suffer by taking away the people closest to her. Shirley actually appears to have found some peace. She ended up getting a lot of help to cope with her childhood and everything she had gone through, and eventually would end up working in the foster care system. She was known as a kind-hearted person, and it looks like she did everything in her power to bring some of the light back into the world after her father took it away from her. All in all, Pee Wee Gaskins was a bad man, and even just calling him a bad man is an understatement. He was absolutely evil. Pee Wee Gaskins was confirmed to have killed 15 people, although he claimed to have killed closer to 110. Do you believe that he was telling the truth and that he killed over 100 people? Or do you think he was just lying for attention and wanted to buy himself more time? We don't know, and we may never know. Charlotte, what do you think? I think, with as with a lot of things, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Do I think Pee Wee was capable of killing all those people? Absolutely. He had no compunction about admitting to any of his confirmed killings and the horrific torture he put his victims through. It really wouldn't be a surprise if everything Pee Wee said about the coastal killings was true. Alas, during his reign of terror through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there was also a ton of other serial killers running rampant, so even if any of the coastal killings victims were ever found, I think it would be pretty hard to confirm if it was Pee Wee or if it was the work of someone else who was killing in the same area. Sadly, I don't think the coastal killings are cases that we're going to crack with time. What about you, Dina? I agree with you. 
I think when you look at the murders he committed, it's pretty easy to see that while he didn't have a particular victim type, he definitely had a pattern that he followed. A lot of the people that he killed were mostly just, just to get them out of the way, whether that was because they annoyed him or because they knew too much. I don't know if he actually went out of his way once a month or so looking for people to kill, but he certainly had no issue when he did kill people, so who knows what he could have done. If you look at the murders we know he committed, we can see that he was incredibly evil and had no remorse. But even if half of the murders he confessed to are true, then he is definitely one of the most evil men America has ever seen. And honestly, we would love your thoughts. Do you think Pee Wee completely told the truth or that he lied? Do you think it was somewhere in between? We do know that during this time, there were so many other serial killers that we'll never know about. This story is just one of the many that we do know about. Imagine all of the things that happened out there that we're just never going to hear about. And with that, our Pee Wee series is over. Yay! Thank God. Thank I don't... God. <laughs> we even, well, Dina was even saying, like, we maybe could have even done a third episode, but, like, we, we're, we're good. Yeah, we're not going to do that to you guys at all. Or ourselves, for that matter. Um, we hope you managed to enjoy it, and we hope you can take a minute, just recover from all of the terrible things we just laid upon you. Next week, we're going to be doing a good old-fashioned palate cleanser, Yay. and we're going to talk about some spooky stuff, so it's a little more lighthearted, kind of take a mental break from the nastiness that was PUE, and we think you're going to enjoy it. Make sure you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at The Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. You can also find us on social media. I'm ominous underscore walrus on Twitter and ominous walrus on Instagram. And I'm Dina V on Twitch, Dina V I G on Instagram, and Dina V tweets on Twitter. Thank you so much for joining us for this harrowing series. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope you can all sleep tonight. This has been The, the Grim, Grim Curriculum. Curriculum.